Hello everyone to the third in our series of seven Target Antibiotic webinars and welcome to World Antibiotic Awareness Week. I'm Professor Clearna McNulty, Head of Public Health England Primary Care Unit and PhD Lead for the Target Antibiotics Project. Here with me today are Dr Nick Francis, who's a GP in South Wales and has a particular research interest in antimicrobial stewardship. And Dr Charles Alessi, a GP in South West London and Senior Advisor to Public Health England on Antimicrobial Resistance. So, last week we discussed acute sore throat and the fever pain school. This week we are moving on to acute cough. Dr Nick Francis will explore managing patient expectations using a filmed consultation between him and his patient. So, we'll now watch the consultation and some examples of what works for Nick in daily practice. So, while you are watching the 14 minute video, think about questions you would like to put to us in the live Q&A that follows. You can do this by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel during or after the video. So, let's sit back and enjoy. Hello, my name is Nick Francis and I'm a GP in South Wales with a research interest in use of antibiotics. This webinar is on managing patient expectations. Now patient expectations are important because they influence what we as prescribers do. Now you may not feel that you're influenced much by what patients want, but there's good evidence to show that patients who expect or want antibiotics are more likely to be prescribed them. And when you think about it, it's not that surprising. We want to maintain good relationships with our patients and to work with them rather than against them. So unless we can be 100% confident that antibiotics won't make the slightest bit of difference, it's understandable that we might be influenced by what the patient wants. But what does the patient really want? Research shows that clinicians make assumptions about what patients want and overestimate the desire for antibiotics. And when a clinician perceives that a patient expects antibiotics, it's an even bigger driver of antibiotic prescribing than actual patient expectations. So one of the key messages from this webinar is don't assume that you know what your patient wants, particularly about antibiotics. Surveys, interviews, focus groups have all shown that patients with respiratory tract infections want a good clinical assessment. They want to be given information about what's wrong with them, to know how long it's likely to last and what they can do to get better quickly. But the majority don't have fixed ideas about the need for antibiotics. Indeed, patients are becoming increasingly worried about using antibiotics. A recent uh, large primary care study of patients with lower respiratory tract infections found that two out of five patients prescribed antibiotics in primary care actually didn't even start taking them. Now clearly there will be some patients who make strong requests or demands for antibiotics usually because they've been trained by their past experience of being given antibiotics for self-limiting infections. And uh, these patients, uh, when, when they have strong demands, I usually start moving towards a discussion about uh, backup or delayed prescribing. However, even patients who ask for antibiotics don't necessarily want them. Some patients are not keen on taking antibiotics, uh, but have been led to believe that they won't get better without them. And uh, these patients are often very happy to avoid antibiotics when they've been given a more evidence-based perspective. Okay, let's move to discussing ways of talking to patients about their expectations and addressing their needs. First, I'd like to emphasize that there's no one right way. And you might want to think about developing a few different approaches that can be used in different situations. Second, uh, managing respiratory tract infections is, is bread and butter stuff for most primary care clinicians and therefore you've probably developed a, a well-established turn of phrase and, and uh, style for these consultations. And changing that uh, isn't necessarily easy, it can feel unnatural at first. I suggest you try out a few different approaches, perhaps with colleagues or friends and family. Practice definitely can help. It's a good idea to discuss which approaches work well and which don't work so well and, and develop a, a practice that you're, you're happy with. But believing that you can improve your, the way you communicate about respiratory tract infections and, and use of antibiotics uh, and that this can make a big difference to you and your patients is a really important first step. A brief webinar can't provide you with comprehensive communication skills training. 
so you can find more training online uh, at the Target Antibiotics Toolkit website, or you can speak to your local medicines management team if you're interested in getting some more training. But uh, I'm going to show you now uh, a couple of things that I find helpful in my own practice. Now, I'm sure most clinicians are familiar with ICE, ideas, concerns, expectations. Um, I actually don't find it all that helpful to ask patients with a respiratory tract infection what they think is wrong with them. But I do find it very helpful to ask them what they're concerned about. I also, and especially if, they, uh, if I get a sense that they're really wanting antibiotics, find it helpful to ask them what their thoughts about antibiotics are. So the following clip shows uh, me consulting with a patient who's coming in about a chesty cough. Hello, Mr. Jenkins. Have a seat. Thank you. Hi. How Hi. are you? Um, well, not too good. I think I think I might have got a, a chest infection. Oh dear. Yeah. Well, tell me more about that. <laughs> um, well, I've I've had a cough for quite a while now, mm. and um, it just um, seems to be going on to my on to my chest. I'm finding it. Um, I'm having trouble sleeping, you know, it's so bad. Oh dear. Yeah. So you say for a while now, how long has it been? Um, oh, probably about 10 days. Okay. Um, it just, you know, it started off with just like a normal cold and um, and then it just sort of, um, the cough wasn't too bad, you know, mm -hmm. to begin with, but it's just got worse. Okay, mm. okay. So you've been coughing about 10 days and yeah. it seems to be getting worse. Yeah. And are you coughing up anything? Um, hmm, I... Well, my my nose is a bit bunged up, mm. um, so yeah, I, I'm coughing up a little bit of phlegm. Okay. Yeah. Any difficulty breathing at all? <laughs> when I yeah, when I have a coughing bout, yes. Mm -hmm. yes okay. Yeah. So if you're coughing a lot, you kind of lose yeah. your breath a bit. What about at other times <laughs> when you're not coughing? Uh, if you're no. exercising and things. No. 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 no, no okay. Not Any really. pains in your chest? No. 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 Have you had a temperature at all? High temperature? <laughs> um, I don't know. I. I don't think so. Okay, no, well, we'll no, check I, that. I don't think so. And um, I see from your records that yeah. you're you're generally healthy, no sort of normal lung problems or anything like that. No, Is that normally right? fine. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, look, I'll, I'll have a good look at you in a second. Before I do, mm -hmm. can you just tell me what is it that you're most worried about? What are your main concerns about this? Um, no real concerns really. I've just, I'm just, you know, want to get rid of this cough. It's just the cough. Yeah. Okay. So you're kind of hoping for something to, to help you get rid of it quickly. <coughs> Definitely. Yeah. If okay. it's something you can give me to. Okay. Are you worried it's something more serious at all? Um, again, no, not really. I just, I'm just sick. You know, I'm yeah. sick of coughing, and I yeah. just want to take, be able to take something to get, get sure. rid of it. Yeah. My, my husband wants me to have antibiotics, so if, if they, if they're going to help, then I'll definitely, I'll definitely give them a go. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you'd be keen to take them if they're yeah. going to help. Yeah, definitely, because nothing, nothing's helping really. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Okay. So let's have a look at you now okay. then, and um, afterwards we'll have a chat about that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. So the patient in that clip just wanted something to make her cough go away more quickly. But sometimes asking about concerns can elicit specific concerns, such as a concern that there's something more serious going on, or context-specific issues, such as wanting to get better before a wedding or a holiday. Asking about antibiotics brings the issue to the fore and starts the discussion. If a patient has very strong views about wanting antibiotics, I don't usually argue with them. I instead try and steer the direction of a backup or delayed prescription. The use of backup prescriptions uh, is discussed in another webinar in this series. As I said before, there are many different ways to elicit patient concerns and expectations, and I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that the approach shown in the, in the video is the best or the right approach. It's important for you to develop a, a way of communicating uh, that you feel comfortable with and, and don't rely, rely on assumptions about why the patients come to see you or assume that the patient will only be satisfied if you prescribe antibiotics. Now then, let's go back to Mrs Jenkins and take a look at one way of discussing diagnosis and treatment. Okay, so I've had a good listen to your lungs. Um, there's a few sounds there, um, probably from phlegm in the airways, uh, but there's no sound of infection in the lung tissue, so that's good news. Oh. Um, your, your temperature is normal, mm -hmm. the oxygen in your bloodstream is normal and your pulse are all normal. Right. So those are all good things as well. Yeah. So what this points to is uh, that you've got an infection in your lungs, but it's not a serious infection. Um, it's in the, in the airways, what we might call bronchitis. Oh, bronchitis. 
um, but there's no evidence of any serious infection actually in the lung tissue themselves. Okay. Now, uh, as I say, it's not a serious infection, it will get better. Uh, we were talking before about antibiotics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Unfortunately, antibiotics don't tend to do anything much for this sort of infection. They don't really make it get better much quicker. Oh, really? um, on average, research shows maybe half a day better, you know, get better half a day quicker. Right. Um, and that has to be balanced against the downsides of antibiotics. Uh, they, they often cause things like a thrush and diarrhea and rashes. Um, and the more we use antibiotics, the more bacteria become resistant to them. So, um, I so I wouldn't really recommend antibiotics for something like this. Oh, you wouldn't? Okay. Um, oh, well, I suppose if, I suppose if they're not going to help, then, then, yeah. then I'm fine with that. Yeah. So yeah. I think you'll get better perfectly well without antibiotics. Um, I can give you some information about the problem. Right, um, okay. So, is there uh, <coughs> any information that you should find helpful? So, as I was right. saying, this is what we think. I think you've got bronchitis, okay. um, and as it says here, it can last up to three weeks. Oh gosh! I know that sounds oh. like a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> I think you'll probably start feeling better much sooner than that. You know, you're probably over the worst of it now. To be honest, you'll probably start feeling better in yourself. Okay. But that cough, that a nagging cough, can just persist yeah. for a while, unfortunately. So I wouldn't worry about it, you know, just because you're still coughing. Right. Um, it, it can drag on, but it, okay. it, it should be gradually getting better. Okay. Mm -hmm. This section goes through some of the things you can do to help yourself. Oh, right. Have you tried anything so far? Have you taken any medicines or anything? Um, well, I've been mean, like paracetamol. Okay. Yeah. Is that helping at all? Um, yeah, well, it can help with the, the cold and, and stuff, you okay. know, and pain. But yeah, I mean, I'm still coughing. So yeah. It's not so paracetamol like doesn't that. really do anything much for <laughs> coughing. It, it can be helpful if you're having pain, if you're aching, you know, headaches, things like right. that. Um, it's not going to do much for, no. the, for the cough. Um, you might want to try some, some cough syrups. They're probably not going to get rid of your cough altogether, but they might help a little bit. Um, and uh, I would suggest you see the pharmacist and talk to right. them about various sort of cough medicines that, that you can try. Okay? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah I'll give um, that a go. There's a few other things here. It's important to try and keep yourself healthy, try and get lots mm -hmm. of rest, eat healthy. Sometimes people, when they've got an infection like this, they're just about getting over it and then they catch another infection. Oh, goodness, so washing your time. hands and eating well <laughs> is all helpful. Okay. The, although antibiotics are unlikely to help you at the moment, mm -hmm. the, you know, if you develop a more serious infection, then they could be important. So right. uh, this section here goes through the sort of things that you should watch out for, okay? okay. So um, if you develop any of these symptoms, then I would like to see you back again. Um, so have a look at that when oh, you get home. So I can take um, it with me. Yeah, take it with you and have a look through. And if right. you've got any questions or concerns, then let us know. Oh, yes, I will too. Thank you. Okay, is that all right then? Yeah, any any questions like, or? Well, yeah, well, I, I suppose I'm just going to have to put up with it then. Aren't I'm afraid so, yeah. yeah. As I say, hopefully you'll be starting to feel better soon. Um, and, uh, you know, the cough medicine hopefully will help. See the pharmacist. And if you've got any concerns, then come back and see me again. Yes, I all right. Okay, thank you very okay. much. Okay, nice to see you. Bye then. Okay, bye bye. 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 When my assessment suggests that the potential benefits from antibiotics is marginal, I tend to be fairly directive and tell the patient that I don't think they need antibiotics. If the picture is less clear, for example, someone with a sore throat and three or four center or fever pain criteria, or someone with a cough who's got risk factors but no significant chest findings, then I tend to explain the potential risks and benefits in, in a more neutral way and ask the patient what they think. Discussing how long the illness is likely to last, um, what they can do to help themselves and what should prompt them to come back can all help increase satisfaction, reduce the risk of unhelpful reconsultation and provide a good safety net in case things do take a turn for the worse. Using the target treat your infection leaflet or other well-designed leaflets can help make this whole process more effective. Most patients that come to see you with a respiratory tract infection are not wedded to the idea that they absolutely have to have an antibiotic, even if they are expecting one because of past experience has led them to believe that antibiotics are needed for chest infections. Good communication really can make a difference, not only in, in terms of how often you prescribe antibiotics, but also in terms of the whole quality of your consultations, making these consultations more satisfying for both you and your patients and leading to patients who feel more empowered and, and consult less frequently and more appropriately. 
Changing your communication style does not have to be difficult or time consuming either. Most of us are probably doing some things really well, but most of us also have areas that could be improved. My challenge to you is to have an open mind, spend some time reflecting on your communication strategies and how they might be improved, and discussing approaches that seem to be helpful or not so helpful with your colleagues. So, my take home messages for you are, don't assume that patients want antibiotics, even if they seem to be hinting that they do. Ask patients about their concerns and or what their thoughts about antibiotics are. Provide them with an assessment of what you think the cause of their symptoms is and how long it's likely to last and what might help. Give the patient an indication of the likely benefits and risks of antibiotics. And finally, consider using printed information such as the treating your infection leaflet to help support what you say. And don't forget that there are many useful resources, including uh, online communication training and patient information leaflets on the Target Antibiotics Toolkit website. Thanks for watching. Welcome back. I hope the video sparked questions in your mind for Dr. Nick Francis and Dr. Charles Alessi about patient expectations and concerns in acute cough. Again, like last week, if you want the Q&A in full screen, click on the icon in the bottom right corner. Please do keep those contentious questions coming. So, um, first um, question. Um, it was an excellent consultation, Nick. Um, we really enjoyed it. But um, Ellen asks, what about the more demanding patients who persist that they need antibiotics? Yes, I think I think not all consultations go uh, as smoothly as that. Um, you know, clearly there are patients who uh, come in with with more fixed ideas. Um, I usually try and explore it a bit better. Um, I think if, uh, uh, if if you've really done a thorough assessment and you've explained um, the the evidence to the patient and, and why you feel they don't need antibiotics, um, but they're unhappy and they're, they're quite fixed on that, I think it's about trying to explore where that uh, misunderstanding or disagreement is, uh, where their beliefs about antibiotics come from. Um, and it depends on the clinical context. Um, you know, obviously there are, there are, there's a spectrum from, from uh, very low risk patients who are very, very unlikely to benefit from antibiotics to those where you've got sort of less certainty. Um, but certainly with, with the sort of the, where the ones where there's, there's, there's slightly less certainty, I would perhaps consider moving on to uh, just talking about a, a backup or delayed prescription in those circumstances uh, if the patient was still very fixed on the idea. So Charles, any thoughts? Yes, I mean, it, this, is, this is a very interesting area because um, um, if you reflect on the number of consultations that we all have with people who have an upper respiratory tract infection, and we all reflect on people who come in with a fixed demand when they come in, uh, very often um, um, uh, we perhaps don't spend enough time trying to unpack what's behind that fixed demand. And you may find that people who come in with a, with a request for antibiotics could well be people who've been used to being given antibiotics in the past every time they presented, or could well be uh, people who have a, 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 a close relative or somebody really close to them who has had an adverse effect from not having an antibiotic, perhaps. Um, I think this is a real opportunity for us to consider, uh, is there some way in which we can manage this a little bit better? Perhaps not for this consultation, but perhaps to bring somebody back and have a further con conversation mm -hmm. to really understand what the issue really is. Mm -hmm. I think the video is really, really useful because it asks a fundamental question. And that question is just ask what people have come here about today and not assume you understand what people have come here about today. So that really takes me on to the next question. Megan asks, how can we actually fit all of this into the five to 10 minute consultation? Well. I, you know, I think general practice is often under a lot of time pressures and I think, you know, it's, it's totally understandable and reasonable for people to be worried about the time pressures. I suppose my answer to that is I think, I think you can fit it into a normal 10 minute consultation, which is the, the norm in, in general practice in the UK. Um, it, uh, you, you know, there are, there are a number of, uh, it, it gets easier the more you do it, so it becomes, uh, you become more efficient at doing it. I think the, the danger is that these 
consultations have traditionally been viewed as, as very brief consultations and often seen as catch-up consultations. So, you know, you're running late and you see someone with a cough, you think, oh, good, you know, can deal with this one really quickly. And I think that's the problem. When you're trying to sort of manage these expectations um, but do it in a very short period of time, that's when patients often end up you know, feeling a bit fobbed off and, uh, and, and can be dissatisfied. Um, but it can be done within a normal 10-minute consultation in most cases, I think. So what do you think about the telephone consultation then? You know, the, doing it over the telephone, is that... Because there's quite a few, of, a lot of that going on. Yeah. Any thoughts on that, Charles? Well, it's a different set of skills you need. Um, uh, uh, we really do rely on the, uh, on the visual cues, don't we, in terms of having a conversation with an individual. And actually learning how to have that consultation on the telephone uh, takes a completely different mindset to actually deliver it. But I think you can still ask the relevant questions. You can still, you can still elicit the important bits of information you need to ensure you don't, um, uh, you don't do anything dangerous and you've, you've, you've safety netted in terms of what you should be doing. Mm. No, I, I would agree yeah. with that. I mean, there's, there's more and more evidence coming out about what are the sort of the real risk factors for adverse outcomes. And a lot of them can be assessed over the phone, things like age and comorbidities, patient reported shortness of breath, uh, chest pain. And, you know, there are, there are some aspects, um, you know, that, that, that require uh, physical examination. But I, I think, you know, you, if, if you've got somebody who, you know, you could assess those features over the phone and they're low risk um, and you've safety netted, uh, I think okay, it's So you could try archer them and decide yeah. whether to bring them in. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that takes me on to a question from Australia. So welcome, Leslie, from Australia. Um, so um, Leslie's saying GPs are paid on the basis of the number of patients they see on Australia, in Australia. So how can a GP change from being a high prescriber to a low prescriber without losing patients or spending all day convincing them. So this is quite, there are, there are other European countries with a similar financial setup to Australia. So hmm. thoughts? Well, I mean, we've talked a bit, a bit about the, the time issue. I think, I think it does take slightly longer than perhaps some people have been used to, but, but can still be done within a reasonable amount of time. I think at the heart of Leslie's question there is the issue of patient satisfaction and, the, and this fear that, you know, if, if you don't prescribe, patients are going to leave dissatisfied and therefore go to uh, another practice. And there's good evidence, actually, that, that patient satisfaction um, is, is good if you actually um, you know, take the time to um, uh, communicate well with them, um, assess their needs um, and, uh, you know, have a good conversation with them about it. So I think it, it can be done. Um, and in fact, you know, there are more and more patients when you when you start bringing up these issues, lots of patients are actually not wanting antibiotics and, and feel dissatisfied when they walk out with a prescription. So prescribing doesn't necessarily lead to patient satisfaction. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think this is, a, this is an absolutely wonderful example of a mismatch between what we expect people want to what they perhaps really want. And uh, perhaps what they want is more of an explanation and is more of a discussion and is more of some advice and support mm. in terms of their lives, not necessarily mm. something to go away with. Mm. Okay, so that brings us on to the next question. Um, in the consultation, Nick, and several people have asked this question, you suggest the patient visits their pharmacist for cough medicines um, and to use paracetamol. So what is the evidence of their value or are you just fobbing them off from your consultation, getting them out to the pharmacist? So I'm teasing you a bit there. No. Well, no, that's all right. So should we start, should we go yeah. through them one by one? What about paracetamol first? Um, well, there's good evidence that paracetamol works for, for pain. Um, so, uh, you know, these infections can be associated with, uh, with pain and I think um, there's certainly some, some benefit there. Um, in terms of uh, cough medicines, um, the evidence is, is not fantastic. Um, there's been a number of studies uh, conducted, but unfortunately, uh, many of them are uh, small studies uh, and studies that are at risk of bias. Some of them are sponsored by a pharmaceutical industry, uh, some of them without having you know, good, clear study questions at the start. Nevertheless, um, there are some um, ingredients that are, in, that are included in many uh, uh, cough syrups, uh, such as dextromethorphan methorphan and uh, guafenicin, um, where there is some evidence uh, that, that they may work. Um, uh, so some trials have shown positive effects. Um, 
and uh, you know there's little evidence of harm in adults children is a different story but in adults there's 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 little evidence that they're harmful Um, and then there's you know various sort of uh, um, pastel type sweet type things which you know may soothe the throat so I suppose my my view is I think one of the challenges we have as, as clinicians is you know you want to do something to help the patient and you know, when, when there's kind of uh, you feel that feeling that there's nothing you can do, uh, you know, I, I think that it's better to sort of suggest that they try something which might or might not work, um, but, you know, there's unlikely to be harmful. So. And what about codeine? Because some people use that as an antitussive. Yeah. So what's the benefit for that? Well, again, not brilliant evidence, but the evidence we have suggests that codeine doesn't work. So uh, I, would, I would suggest uh, advise against prescribing codeine. And so shall we tick off the last one? What about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs? Um, so uh, ibuprofen, again, uh, helpful for pain. Um, Although there was a very good study uh, conducted a few years ago here in the UK that um, looked at patients with respiratory tract infections and compared paracetamol and ibuprofen um, with uh, um, advice to take uh, as needed or or regularly, uh, and they found no additional benefit from ibuprofen over paracetamol. So again, paracetamol is slightly safer, so I, I would usually suggest starting with paracetamol. Although there may be patients who, you know, who benefit from ibuprofen that that haven't benefited from paracetamol. So, Charles, I've got a question for you. So what what role does the patient have in all of this communication? I think there are two dimensions to that question. I want to to touch on something which Nick um, talked about. Of course, sorry, yes. And it's about the pharmacy, because I think we don't quite use pharmacies as much as we could in situations like this. Um, and pharmacies are in the process of changing. I mean, there's this, these new healthy living pharmacies, which have now been about for about seven or eight years. And healthy living pharmacies are places which uh, really assist people in, in understanding themselves, in other words, guiding around self-care. They assist people in terms of healthy lifestyles, but they also, and most importantly, um, uh, uh, deliver a, a level of consistency in the way they treat conditions, specifically minor ailments. So I think there could be some confidence in us referring onto a pharmacy, knowing that they're going to get consistent advice in terms of what people should and shouldn't do when they, when they have a, a minor illness. But going on to people, I think people can do an awful lot. For a start, they can understand that um, uh, 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 it's really up to them to help themselves to start with in general. I mean, if you... If you smoke 20 a day and you have a cough regularly, perhaps the two could be related. And perhaps managing one may assist you in managing the other. Um, um, Also, uh, understanding that the conditions themselves may not necessarily only last 48 hours, but may last for longer than that. In other words, not going to seek advice unnecessarily Mm. um, uh, is also very useful. Just maintaining a healthy lifestyle and understanding one's body. And and I think, course, I think yes. that point yeah. on, on you know, the duration, particularly for cough, you know, cough, we know from observational studies that cough routinely lasts three to yeah, four three weeks. weeks. So, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, and that's a message which just isn't out there in the public. So we need to be promoting that message that uh, this isn't something, uh, you know, in fact, if you, in, if you see patient, patients and you say, you know, well, if it's not better in a few days, you're, you're encouraging yeah, reconsultations yeah. because yes. it, it doesn't get better in a few yeah. days. And of course, we've mentioned the target treat your infection leaflet, yes. which has the duration. Mm. Yes. So that's um, that's available on the website as well. So there's a few people um, who've asked this. So uh, why aren't you advocating the use of near point testing and CRPs in suitable patients? So why don't we talk with um, about the value of CRP first? So. How do you use it in your daily practice, Nick? And what, you know, what is the evidence for CRP in acute cough? So yes, CRP is the up and coming thing. Um, and there is, um, there's been a number of trials now looking at using CRP in practice uh, for, for patients with acute cough, lower respiratory tract infection. And it is helpful, you know, it can reduce antibiotic prescribing. Um, so there's definitely a role for CRP. Um, I think it's important to say though that, you know, that, that it, you need to define the the role. Um, CRP is a tool which can be helpful in addition to your clinical assessment. Um, it's not a um, you know a, a, a switch that tells you whether you should or shouldn't prescribe antibiotics. 
So patients that are at very low risk, um, you know, with a, with a very low chance of benefiting shouldn't be tested with CRP generally. Patients who are very high risk where you think this patient's got pneumonia or is are very ill shouldn't be tested for CRP. It's for those intermediate patients where you're not quite sure there's perhaps a few risk factors or the patient's got some symptoms which uh, suggest uh, you know potentially higher risk um, and uh, in those situations it can be helpful. Um, again there's evidence that it, it adds to the diagnostic value in addition to a, a thorough clinical assessment. So there's definitely a role. So do you use it yourself? Well, we don't have um, a, a machine um, belonging to the practice. I actually am involved in a trial using uh, CRP for uh, COPD patients at the moment. Um, so we do use it in the context of the trial. Um, but no, we haven't, uh, we haven't got a machine uh, for use in, in patients with low So have you been infection. surprised sometimes at the results or...? Had yes, high results when you were expecting it to be low and vice yeah, versa? Yeah, certainly in, in the trial, um, so in the COPD patients, um, I have been of patients with uh, productive cough, discoloured sputum, uh, where you, you probably would have prescribed, well, you almost certainly would have prescribed antibiotics, mm -hmm. and they've come back with a very low um, CRP value. So in that setting, I have been surprised, although I should emphasise the trial results aren't out yet, so uh, we can't okay, really yes. sort of comment on that. But, um, but you know... It, it, I, I think you know it's definitely something that clinicians who participated in the trials have said they found very helpful. So do you think, uh, maybe Charles I could ask you, do you think CRP would be something that's useful for practices with particularly high prescribing? So obviously you know a CCG has to prioritise you know their costs and so with the you know trying um, to reduce prescribing um, could they target the CRP to particular practices or what, how do you think we should be doing this? Um, I think as part of a, a, a focused educational process which includes CRP as one of its constituents, I think that that has merit. But the, but the, the concept of CRP being used as the panacea or the antidote to high prescribing I think is potentially not necessarily the most helpful. And I, I wouldn't advocate that. I, what I would think is that CRP can assist in times where you're more likely to prescribe, and perhaps there could be occasions when you don't prescribe as a result. Uh, and that's the, the obvious space. But in selected, targeted uh, group of individuals and group of patients. Yeah, I don't know whether you no, agree. I agree with that. And I think it's worth saying that the, the trial evidence, you know, that some of the biggest trials... Um, uh, compared um, CRP testing to uh, communications-based strategies. Um, and in fact, um, the, the CRP testing is no more effective. They're about equally effective used individually, and most effective is when you put them together. So uh, it's not a substitute for um, good communication, um, but it can be an additional kind of benefit on top of that. And of course, also the CRP can medicalize the yeah. illness, can't it? So they yeah. come back for their CRP yeah. rather than for a another cons you know the full consultation yeah. we love switches don't we we love having a switch we can sort of press mm -hmm. we can we can look and th there's only two ways it can go <laughs> one way you get treated one way you don't life isn't as simple as that we're always going to have to make judgments people are individuals but, but interestingly <laughs> you know in i think it's helpful for clinicians clinicians like that sort yeah. of you know having yeah, yeah. That, that, that test but a lot of clinicians have said that they they feel that you know it's helpful for educating patients, whereas uh, in fact in the trials, in the qualitative evaluations after trials, patients have largely said, oh, I, I didn't care about the test, that was up for, that's for the doctor to decide. You know? <laughs> so it, you know, it, it may be helpful for some patients, yeah. but I think it's more about you know, helping the clinician in their clinical decision. Mm -hmm. um, you can certainly, you know, patients by and large trust us and you, know, you, you can convey that message without having to rely on a machine. Yes, so actually a recent study showed that 95% of us trust our GP whether mm -hmm. we want an antibiotic or not. So let's, there were some other questions about near patient tests. So what is the value of oximetry? So maybe we could discuss that briefly and how you use it in your daily practice, both of you. So I, I think pulse oximetry is very uh, useful. Um, there's certainly there's evidence uh, coming out that it does, again, add to the, the, the diagnostic uh, process uh, along with a range of clinical features, some of the ones I mentioned before, but things like pulse, which again, you can get from your pulse oximetry, blood pressure, uh, respiratory rate. Um, and uh, so, it, so it does help in terms of the, the diagnosis. And I also just find it helpful in terms of that 
you know, patients do want to have a, a, a thorough assessment. And, um, you know, I think, I think measuring their, their uh, oxygen saturation and their, their pulse uh, using a pulse oximeter is a very is, is part of that sort of comprehensive evaluation, and it doesn't need to take a lot of time. You know, I, I shove it on as I start listening to the chest, give it some time to settle, and then uh, have a look at it afterwards and take seconds. So, I, I mean, I, I would hope that most GPs yeah. have pulse oximeters now. Um, yeah, as long as they use them. The problem is sometimes people don't use them quite as routinely as they could. Mm. Um, so having a uh, having a, an oximeter next to a spirometer in a clinical room rather than the place you're seeing people may not be the most helpful mm. because then you'd be interrupting the consultation to go and get an oximeter. So maybe that. that's an action to find out, you know, where is... Well, it, pulse they're pretty yeah. cheap, you know. You hand, you know, little finger ones are very cheap, and uh, I, I would suggest that most clinicians should have yeah. them in their consultation rooms. So actually, that brings us on to the next question because it, it's sort of it's related. Um, so it's the sort of patient you might use oximetry in because you might not use it in everybody. So would prescription for antibiotics vary if they are elderly, paediatrics, or immunosuppressed patients? So. Um, Joseph's asked this, so I suppose the same thing with the oximetry. Yeah, so it's it's very clear that the vast majority of patients with uh, um, lower respiratory tract infection where you, you don't suspect pneumonia um, will have a good outcome. Um, there have been several large-scale studies of a trial uh, with over 2,000 patients randomised to amoxicillin or placebo and uh, no deaths um, and I think only three hospitalizations. Um, we know that the vast majority of patients are, are, are going to be fine, um, but those at higher risk are older patients, um, multiple comorbidities, um, and as I said, with uh, presenting with, with symptoms so that, that are more concerning, shortness of breath, um, low blood pressure, tachycardia, um, low pulse oximetry, low, low, low oxygen saturation. So. Um, I think I think yes, age and comorbidities um, are important. I, I think it's part of that uh, overall assessment. Agree. Um, uh, nothing much to add. I think I think you've answered the question perfectly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now here's another. You mentioned the target leaflet in the consultation. So here's a question about leaflets, which you're an expert on, because of course you developed the when should I worry leaflet for children. So how important is the actual leaflet? and how it's given in the consultation in promoting patient behavioural change. So we talk about the leaflet a lot. So how important is actually giving it and how should we give it? Well, I think there's a couple of things to say about that. One, we know for certain that um, just providing leaflets through the post or leaving them in waiting rooms um, is not effective. There, there were trials where they've posted leaflets to patients' homes and. Um, and, and that you know hasn't been shown to be effective. It is. It is. So it's part of um, the the consultation. Um, patients uh, like it. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of qualitative um, information from patients uh, saying that they value getting this information. It helps them to feel more reassured, to know when they should come back again, to know how long the conditions like to last for. Um, so patients like it. I think. It's also helpful for clinicians because we talked before about that that desire to want to do something, and you know this way you, you can feel as though you're doing something. Mm -hmm. you, you're doing something positive. Uh, you're giving them something. The patients leaving the room with something which they value, um, and that can be helpful. You know, rather than just ending the consultation saying sorry, nothing I can do for you. Uh, agree. The more personalised that 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 message is, uh, clearly the better. The more it's listened to. And I think it's the way we treat the leaflet, uh, because um, uh, we've all been in situations where we've had an explanation about something, and then as an afterthought, people said, oh, and here's a leaflet. And I, I would suggest that's probably the most likely um, uh, uh, time that leaflets were perhaps not listened to or read as, as well as they could be. Uh, as against at other times where you make the leaflet part of the discussion, mm, yeah, then absolutely. it's different then it's something you, 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 you refer to because it's about you. Yeah, absolutely. If you, if you show that you value it, you yeah. know, that, that you think this is good information, yes. you highlight bits, then the patient's going to read it. If it's something, oh, by the way, I've taught oh, to give way, you this, you know, yeah, then that's not going to be helpful. <laughs> and, and also the leaflets, can, you can incorporate them and it becomes part of the patient's notes. Yes. 
So a lot of the computer systems do have that now. So yeah. so that's great. And I would say to clinicians, you know, have a look at them beforehand. You know, learn what's on them because, you know, it, it helps you to sort of you know give it out and to endorse it if you know what's on it. So it also helps you frame your consultation yeah. to a degree. Yeah. I think it's it's useful in a whole host of different yeah. um, uh, dimensions. So we've got some positive feedback. So well done, uh, Nick, for mentioning the pharmacists and their support. Um, but somebody else says, how do we improve relationships between GPs and pharmacists? Um, because they say, we have patients who claim pharmacy has referred them for antibiotics for chest conjunctivitis or sore throat. Mm. And they then come to the, come to the practice and say, we've been told to come for antibiotics. So how do you deal with this and how can we improve this? And what do you do? First of all, we we'll take it in two parts. First of all, what do you do with the patient first? And then how can we improve relationships for Charles? So. Well, I think it's a really important question. Um, not just um, getting a consistent message between pharmacists and GPs, but a consistent messages between you know, different GPs in the practice and out of hours. You know, lots of patients tell us that they get different messages from different people and they find it really confusing and, and frustrating. So I think it's uh, I think as a as a collective body, you know, the health service, we, we need to try and tackle this issue and make sure we're giving consistent messages. Um, I think we are doing that much more now. And, I think, and I think antibiotic it is awareness happening. day coming up, all the different professional societies are involved. Yeah. yeah. yeah so sorry, absolutely. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I no, just... no, absolutely. I think I think we're getting better and I think that's really an important part. Um, and that you know that it is a challenge um, when if a patient comes to you and says, "Oh, the pharmacist told me to come and see you." I mean, I, I approach it in a similar way, really, by doing a, a thorough assessment um, and saying, "Well, you know, the pharmacist obviously had concerns, but you know, I've now listened to your chest and checked your pulse oximetry and checked your temperature, and um, you know, I, I can reassure you that you've got no signs that I'm worried about." So. Um, I think that's that's probably the way to do it, but I, you know I'm, I don't have all the answers. I think nobody has the answers, <laughs> but clearly, clearly trying to do um, uh, trying to be as professional as possible yes. in those situations, which is what you describe, uh, is what I would suggest is the right way to do mm. it as well. Because um, uh, not necessarily saying a pharmacist shouldn't have sent you, but, but, but you know making an assessment independently mm. and mm. and and. and uh, in an appropriate way is, is, is the best way to manage that. In terms of the relationships issue, I think it's an important thing which, uh, which was brought up. Uh, but again, I think we're getting to a different place now. As we're starting to think more about um, uh, uh, commissioning for value, we're starting to think more about population health rather than just dishing out stuff in terms of how we act. Uh, we are starting to actually act in a very similar way. I mentioned the Healthy Living Pharmacy Initiative because that's an initiative which encourages pharmacists to form part of that primary care system, mm -hmm. that primary mm -hmm. care home, mm -hmm. which is really what we want to actually deliver on all mm -hmm. of us, including mm -hmm. our patients. So I think this is work in progress. No, we don't have a perfect system yet. And in answer to the question, I mean, I think if, if uh, GPs, if primary care um, centres um, can form relationships with their local pharmacies, I think that's a great thing. So um, I, I would encourage that. So we're um, almost ready to finish now. So we could mention, of course, that Antibiotic Awareness Day um, comes up this week. And so really do encourage all your patients to be antibiotic guardians. And also somebody asked about, um, is antibiotic resistance a permanent consequence if inappropriate um, antibiotics are given? And I think we can say no, they're not, because there's some evidence that resistance is reducing mm -hmm. um, in the UK. So that is good news, although in other areas worldwide, antibiotic resistance is increasing. So we've got two competing challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and so antimicrobial stewardship is incredibly important. So that's um, the end of this third webinar. And many thanks for participating. I do hope that sharing experiences of how to understand patients' expectations and address them will help you in your daily practice. Don't forget to explore all the materials associated with the webinar. You can replay the video and you can also find links to the Target Treat Your Infection leaflet on the um, website too. You will soon be receiving an email asking you to reflect on how you may take forward actions suggested in the webinar 
and giving us some feedback. Please do complete this if at all possible, as it will help us all to improve. So see you next week for webinar four, uh, when our topic is backup antibiotic prescribing. How can we do it? I know there's been a lot of questions about this already, so come next week to hear Professor Paul Little. So until then, goodbye.